95. Not yet. You're getting close. Jean, she looks pretty good for 82, 83. Um, that's right. <laughs> This 95-year-old man was out on his boat in a pond and enjoying the day, and he looked over on a lily pad, and there was a frog. And he was just enjoying watching the frog, and the frog says, pick me up, kiss me. I'll become a beautiful princess, and I'll become your bride. And he ignored it. He thought, I can't be hearing this. Pretty soon again, pick me up, kiss me. I'll become a beautiful princess, and then I'll become your bride. So the 95-year-old man thought, that's interesting, picked up the frog, put it in his pocket. Pretty soon the frog says, I said, kiss me. I'll become a princess and I'll become your beautiful bride. He says, nah, at 95, I'd rather have a talking frog. (laughs) You know, when you get a certain age, your values change, don't they? Just a little bit. But we're glad you're here. I am excited about uh, this message, God's vision for you. It's one of the, the, the concepts and one of the truths that turned my life around when I was a young man. And uh, I, I was so depressed, and I was even suicidal for about five years. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing changed until I understood this concept. So I want to talk about it once again today. And just as a review... How many here would say that you're frustrated with current circumstances? I mean, I think just about everybody. There's so many things that are going on in our lives, and we know how to pray, and so we pray and pray and pray, and sometimes we see very few results, and then we start asking God, why? Why this? Why that? As I said, um, I had a, uh, between the ages of about 17, 16 to about 23, I had six just horrible years and during that time, I, I prayed. I was, I was steeped in inferiority and suicidal thoughts, and I hated life, and I prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God to deliver me, and, and God never delivered me in the way that I wanted him to deliver me. And uh, he spoke to me one day, and he says, I have already delivered you. And I didn't understand that, and I had to go on a search. Uh, I went to church all the time. My dad was a pastor. I didn't know how to get out of the pit I was in. And so a lot of this message is the things that I learned during that time, and it's become so meaningful to me. Um, This is what I've found out, that when I'm in a hard place, a lot of times my circumstances don't change first. My vision from God changes first. When When I go into prayer, and prayer is so important because that's the avenue whereby I talk to God and God talks to me. And then when God talks to me, I I get a new vision for my life, for my future. And uh, once I get that vision from God, I begin to immerse myself in it, and uh, I I, I receive hope. I I realize there is a future and a hope for me. Uh, God has a future and a hope for you. Turn to somebody and say, God has a future and a hope for you. I mean, God loves you. God values you. You, you don't have to stay where you are in life. There's so much more for you that you have not experienced yet. And uh, what happens is when I begin to immerse myself, I, I begin to s- hear the words of the Lord. And those, the, the word of the Lord gave me a brand new vision of who I was and who he was and what my future looked like. And I begin to immerse myself in it and begin to think about it and talk about it and, and, and meditate on it. And as you begin to believe the new vision, pretty soon you speak differently, you act differently, you have different priorities, you do different things. And then what happens is your circumstances begin to align with the vision that God has given you. And that's how change happens from the inside out. And a few weeks ago, we talked about Gideon. Remember Gideon? Here, they, Israel was being destroyed by the Midianites for seven long years. Their crops were being burned. Their cattle were being destroyed. The, wife, the wives and the children were being taken away. All kinds of horrible things. Israel was hiding in holes. They were hiding in caves. Gideon, he was in a cave threshing. He was in a hole, a wine press, threshing wheat. He was hiding when an angel they appeared to him. They had been praying for seven years. Oh, God, 
deliver us. Oh God, set us free. Oh God, don't you see? Don't you care? Nothing happened in seven years until God sent an angel to Gideon. And what was the message to Gideon? Anybody remember? You are a mighty man of valor, right? You will save Israel. Now, did Gideon accept the message, yes or no? No, he said, no, nah, who are you talking to? I'm the poorest in my, uh, in my family. I'm the least of my clan. I'm a nobody. I'm going nowhere to happen. Can't you see all the circumstances? It's not like that. You've got it all wrong, right? And then he had to go through a series of tests so that he would truly believe the word that the angel gave him. And they became, he became a mighty conqueror, and it happened just as the angel said. But here's the bottom line. God's vision for you is always based on what he's spoken to your heart, either by his spirit or through his word. Everybody say, by his spirit or through his word. And when we pray and we seek the Lord, he has a current word for your situation. I don't care what you're facing. God is not a God of defeat. He's a God of victory. He's a God of life. He's a God of love. He's a God of uh, of. Uh, solutions. He really is. The Holy Spirit lives big on the inside of us today. How many know we are redeemed from the curse of the law? How many know the blood is made a way for us not to be dominated by Satan and evil and sin and substance abuse and darkness and anger and hatred? We don't have to be bound and controlled by that any longer. Amen. Why? Because Jesus has prevailed on our behalf. So God's vision for you is always based upon what God has spoken. And the, and the vision that you have today in your heart becomes your reality tomorrow. That's why there is such warfare over the vision you hold in your heart. There is the enemy, this is what he does through circumstances, through people, through opinions, through feelings, through emotions. His objective is to stamp a vision of darkness and death and calamity and destruction and bondage and habits and sin on the canvas of your heart. And he'll bring suggestions to your heart and suggestions to your mind. And he'll tell you everything's going to go wrong and you're going to die young. And oh yeah, that pain you have in your side, it's cancer. And you're going to be dead by the time you're 52. And you're going to die of a heart attack just like your father. And your kids are going to be on drugs. And there's no hope. Anybody relate to that? The enemy's trying to bring a vision of calamity and darkness because he knows this is a spiritual reality. The vision you hold in your heart today becomes the reality you experience tomorrow. It's not just about praying to God and hoping he'll sovereignly somehow intervene into your circumstances. How many know we co-partner with God in the earth? He's the senior partner. I'm the junior partner. And he comes and he reveals truth in my heart. He gives me a vision of victory in my life. And all of a sudden now after I prayed, I become someone on target with a brand new vision which affects everything about me. How I think, how I act, what I say, where I go, what I prioritize. Everything changes because I'm not only talked to God, but God has talked to me about the circumstance. I love this, what Bob Sorge, she's a worship leader, this is what he says. He says, everything in the kingdom of God depends on whether or not we hear the word of God. Things don't change when I talk to God. Things change when God talks to me. You know, we, we are in a crisis in the church in America. You know why? Because we no longer hold to the inerrancy of God's word like we once did. Because of secularism and humanism and atheism and all kinds of things that really have infiltrated our culture. We're not really sure this is right anymore. And if you're not sure that this is right anymore, you have no foundation for you to grab onto and have a great tomorrow. How many know God means what he says and he, and he says what he means? And every word from God is alive. Every word from God can change your, your situation. One word from God today will change your life forever. That's why we ask you to pray. Pray in the Spirit. Read the Word of God. Stand upon His promises. Why? Because things don't change when I just talk to God. Things change when God talks to me. 
and he gives me a new reality in my heart. This is what Pastor Cho, the author of the book, um, The Fourth Dimension, you can get it on Amazon, use copy for just a couple bucks. I would get it if I were you, read it two or three times. But uh, this is what Pastor Cho says. He says, take the brush of prayer, dip it in the ink of God's word, and paint a brand new picture on the canvas of your heart. You don't have to stay in the pit you're in. You can live in victory. I don't care what it is that you're facing, what struggle, what storm, what problem, you can live in victory. Isn't that encouraging? Hallelujah. Well, how many have your Bibles with you? I'm not going to give you the scripture. I'm going to read the scripture, but you're going to read it right along with me, right? Well, I can tell you're really excited about that. You're going to read the scripture right along with me, right? right. Woohoo! <laughs> this is good stuff. Man, I tell you what, the word of God is the most valuable possession I have. I've based my entire life and my entire eternity on what God, on what God said. How about you? I mean, this is, this is worth more than gold and silver and any other treasure. You get this in your life and you act on it, you believe it, wow. Mark chapter 4, a familiar scripture. I don't know if I've preached on it in years, but look at this. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that same day when evening had come, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. What did he say to them? Let's go over to the other side of the lake. All right, Jesus, let's do it. And leaving the throng of people, they took Jesus with them just as he was in the boat in which he was sitting and the other boats were with him. And a furious storm of wind of hurricane proportions arose and the waves kept beating into the boat so that it was already becoming filled. But Jesus himself was in the stern of the boat asleep on the leather cushion. And they awoke him and they said to him, Master, Master, ah, do you not care that we perish? Ah! Now, how many know this is a pretty serious thing? I mean, the boat's full. Hurricane proportion wins. And Jesus, what's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. Can you believe it? Why is he sleeping? Because he already gave them the word. The word was, we're going to pass over to the other side of the lake. He not only said it, he believed it. Right? The disciples didn't believe it. They believed their circumstances more than they believed Jesus. <laughs> well, aren't you glad he's gracious? He's a good God. You know, when we are stinkers and we don't believe his word and we go our own way, he's, he's there for us and he reaches out to us, he loves us anyway. Aren't you glad for that? Well, look at this. They said, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 39, and he rose and rebuked the wind, said, Hush now, be still. And the wind ceased and there was immediately a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. Jesus said to them, why are you so timid and fearful? How is it that you have no faith, no firmly relying trust? Now here's the deal. In the midst of all the storm, they're crying out to him and they go to Jesus. And what happens when they go to Jesus? Jesus says to them, where's your faith? He rebukes them. Now how many know when you have a storm, you're supposed to go to Jesus? Jesus. Is that a right to pray when you're in a tough time and the hurricane winds are coming? Is that a right to go to Jesus? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Go to Jesus. Well, they went to Jesus and they get rebuked. Why on earth would they get rebuked? You know why they got rebuked? Because even though they were willing to pray, they'd already reached a conclusion about what was going to happen. Jesus is in our boat. Jesus, help us. We're going to perish. So why pray if you're going to maintain the vision of perishing? And Jesus had to rebuke them. How many times do we pray? Have you ever prayed like that? <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'm going down. <laughs> I've done that so many times. The Lord says, well, why bother praying then? Isn't that true? You know, if you've already decided how it's going to turn out, why go to God about it? 
Because if you go to God about it, one of the requirements of victory is that you're going to have to change the vision of your future after you pray rather than before you pray. You have to see something different in your heart. You've got to believe that God is there and that God loves you and that his word is true. You see, they didn't believe his word. So he rebuked them. Wow. All righty. Mark chapter 5. This is verse 25. There is a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. How many know that's pretty serious? 12 long years. She got weaker and weaker and weaker every day. They didn't have the medical facilities like they had today. Can you imagine 12 years? How many know that's a long time? She had endured much suffering under the hands of many physicians. She had spent all her money. She was no better. She rather grew worse. I mean, no, this is pretty hopeless. Don't you think she prayed? I'm sure, you know, they had a lot of uh, different religious ideas in those days. They believed in God or gods. I'm sure she prayed. She was hoping, but there was no change. But what happened? Something happened here. Can you imagine how weak she was? How disappointed she was? Verse 27, when she heard the reports concerning Jesus and she came up behind him, in the throne and touched his garment, for she kept saying, if I can only touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. Wow. You know what the change was? The whole change came when she heard of Jesus. I wonder what she heard of Jesus. Here she is, she's in a hopeless situation, but she heard something. Something that changed her perspective. Something that replaced the old vision of perishing to a new vision of total health. What did she hear? Well, it says she heard of Jesus. This is what it says. Matthew 14, 36. As many as touched Jesus were made perfectly whole. Matthew 12, 15, great multitudes followed Jesus and he healed every one of them. Luke 6, 19, the whole multitude sought to touch Jesus and he healed them all. Matthew 8, 16 and 17, when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and he healed all that were sick. How many did he heal? Every one of them. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, who said, Jesus himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. Wow. How many know Jesus is still healing the sick today? That Jesus is still fulfilling the prophet's word that Jesus himself took our infirmities. He carried our sicknesses. Always remember, you are included in the hour of Matthew 8, 17. Wow. Isn't that awesome? How many know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Psalms 103, verses 1, 2, and 3 says, he forgives all of your sins and he heals all. He forgives all your sins. He heals all your diseases. He heals all your... He heals all your... Isn't that something? That's what it says. Wow. So when she heard of Jesus, everything changed. A brand new perspective, a brand new vision. Wow, now she has hope. And look at this. When she heard the reports, verse 27 of Jesus, she came up behind him in the throng and touched his garment, for she kept saying, if I only touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. She kept saying it. 
She heard the report, she kept saying it. She heard the report, she kept saying it. And immediately, her flow of blood was dried up at the source and suddenly she felt in her body that she was healed of her distressing ailments and Jesus, recognizing in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around immediately in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples kept saying to him, you see the crowd pressing hard around you from all sides and you ask, who touched me? Still, he kept looking around to see her her who had done this. But the woman, knowing what had been done for her, though alarmed and frightened and trembling, she fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has restored you to health. The word health there is sozo. Your faith has made you whole. Sozo, the Greek word for sozo means in your body, you are healed. In your spirit, you are restored to God. You are forgiven. You are born again. In your mind, you have peace. You have joy. You have strength. You have grace. You are completely 100% well, spirit, soul, and body because of your faith. And you press through your obstacle. You press through your symptoms. She pressed through all the weakness in her body. For her to travel at all in that weakened condition was an act of faith. And God says, your faith has made you whole. I did a study. I found out 24 different times in, in the Gospels that Jesus healed individuals. Not groups, but individuals. And 17 or 18 of those times, he talks about their individual faith as the, the reason that they became whole. Isn't that interesting? How many know if her faith made her whole, your faith can make you whole? I remember uh, Billy Burke when he was here. Remember Billy Burke? Uh, I really enjoyed his ministry, evangelist from, um, from Florida. And he told the story when he was nine years old, <coughs> he had a brain tumor, inoperable. He was dying. He had two weeks to live. He was living with his grandma in the Tampa, uh, Florida area. And uh, she was, uh, I, no, I, I was wrong. That's where he lives now. He, he lived at that time in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Catherine Kuhlman was coming to town. And uh, everybody has heard, uh, many have heard about Catherine Kuhlman and her great healing ministry. And you know what grandma said to Billy Burke? Five times a day. Billy, I'm going to take you to Catherine Kuhlman, and when she touches you, when that woman touches you, you're going to be made whole. And Billy says, I didn't know if I believed that or not, but Grandma just kept saying it. Billy, when you go, I'm going to take you to Catherine Kuhlman. When she touches you, you're going to be made whole. She told him that a hundred times in the days previous to them going. On the day of the Catherine Kuhlman crusade, that they were, there was such a crowd, they sat in the, in the balcony and she, at the end of the service, saw him and called him out. And he says, no, I'm not going down there with that crazy woman. No. She, excuse me, called him out again pretty soon. Grandma, the ushers go up there to go get him. And grandma and him come on down on the platform. And he touches him. He flies backward. He gets up. Goes to the, to the hospital, gets new x-rays, no tumor. How many know you can school yourself into faith and you can school yourself out of faith? You can use this principle for God or you can use it for the devil. You can speak your circumstances and your negative emotions and all of the things that are happening that are contrary to God's word and God's vision for you. You can do that if you want to and you will abort the purposes of God and even make a road open for the enemy to come and work against you. Did you know that's true? You know, I remember, I, I read an article not too long ago, people that are dying because by habit they are declaring death over themselves prematurely. I'm going to die young. My father died young. I expect to die young. They say it and say it and say it and say it, and pretty soon what do they do? They die young just as they predicted. Isn't it amazing how God has wired you that your words determine even your level of faith? Wow. 
I know so many tests that God puts me through where circumstances are going directly against what he's given me in my heart or what he's told me through his word so many times. I mean, even in this past thing on this election, I'm telling you, I was so concerned about an anti, anti-Christ agenda just being coming more entrenched in our nation and uh, just more entrenched in all kinds of policies and procedures. You know, you can look at the abortion thing, you can look at the redefining marriage thing, but there's more and more and more coming down the pike in our nation to take us away from our Christian roots and to make us a secular nation, to make us an atheistic nation, a humanistic nation. And this election, I don't know if I prayed more than ever before about this election, being up sometimes most of the night, praying, crying out to God, praying in the spirit. And here on October 16th, God gave me a word on the election at 1230 in the morning. And I wrote it down, gave me some scriptures, and I said, God, how can this be? Every poll, every circumstance, everything is contrary to this. But I wrote it down, and I'm telling you what, I went through the fire of my faith for the next two and a half weeks. And I, I, you, my wife, she's over in Video Cafe today, and she's doing some help with the growth track, so she's not here. But she vouched in the first service that from that time forward, I had to make a decision Am I going to speak in line with what God said for the vision of the future of America? Or am I going to speak in in line with the way it looks and the way I feel and what everybody is saying right now? I had a choice. And I decided, Lord, I don't want to, but I'm going to speak what I believe you said. I'm going to speak according to the new vision. How many know that's really tough when everything's going backwards? When everything's going the wrong way and all your friends are, think you're goofy and they judge you and they persecute you because you're standing for righteousness. Can I get a witness? Anybody out here? Amen. Everybody know what it's like. And you just stay your gun and you say, no, thus saith the Lord. I mean, if you can't trust God, who can you trust? Is that right? Don't shout me down just because I'm preaching real good. Glory to God. I'm telling you what, I believe that in this scripture that you and I can get the same results that the woman with the issue of blood got. How many believe Jesus is alive and he's here right now? You can touch his garment right now. You can get breakthroughs right now. If you follow five steps that this woman with the issue of blood followed, you can have the same results right now. I believe it. Because it's scriptural, again, I'm taking you through story after story after story on God's vision for you to show you that this is biblical. This is how the woman with the issue of blood got the victory. She was sick for 12 years. She was weak. She was bleeding all the time. But what's the first step? She heard of Jesus. She got a new vision. All of a sudden, she heard about this Jesus everywhere he went. He healed everyone that ever came to him. He went and he, great throngs followed him and he healed them all. You know, isn't that something? How many of you know you don't hear that in church too much anymore? Because we build our theology on our experiences and not what God's word says. Now, that doesn't mean that if we haven't received breakthrough immediately that we're out of the will of God. No, because there's some times where we walk by faith for months or weeks or years and don't see the results. But that doesn't change the word of God. And God doesn't want you to fix your eyes on what you can see. But fix your eyes on what you can't see because the things which you can see are temporary and the things which you can't see are eternal. Amen. And we're people of faith, so get used to seeing God's vision and believe in it, even though it hasn't manifest yet. So what do we do? First of all, get a new vision. I'm so glad that I can go to the Word of God, and I can, in prayer, I can dip the brush of prayer into the ink of the Word of God and paint a new picture on the canvas of my heart of who I am in Christ. I remember for years and years when I was suicidal and depressed and everything else, you know what I thought? I thought my life was no good. I had no hope. I had no abilities. I was a nobody. And God was against me because everything, every day I wanted to do the right thing, but I always blew it somehow. And I was always under condemnation and always felt guilty and always felt under a rock somewhere. You know what got me out of that? A vision from God. 
Colossians 1.22, in the body of Jesus' death, in the body of Jesus' flesh, through death, I am presented to the Father holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Woohoo! Somebody get happy with me. So here I was, depressed and dark and suicidal, and I'm no good, and I have no abilities. All of a sudden, I started rejecting that and getting a new vision saying, in the body of Jesus' flesh, through his death on Calvary, I am presented to the Father, holy, unblameable, unreprovable, in his sight. Woohoo! So I'd say that 20 times a day, 30 times a day, 40 times a day. I got endless loop cassettes. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, endless loop cassettes, and they were, you know, 10 minutes repeatable. They were an upgrade from eight tracks. (laughs) Anybody remember eight tracks? (laughs) Well, we were in the cassette age, man. I got those 10 minutes, and I would would identify all the, the wrong thinking patterns that were destroying me, that were anti-biblical, I would identify them, and then I would find scriptures that opposed those negative thinking patterns, and I would read them onto those 10-minute endless loop cassettes, and then I would speed them up so they would sound like, and and I'd play them all day, and I'd play them all night. I was installing a brand new vision. I was immersing myself in in what God said, not what I felt. Because I knew if I could get it in my heart, it would change me. And pretty soon I no longer felt suicidal and depressed and like my life was not worth anything because I got the truth of what God said. And when you get the truth of what God said, it sets you free. There's a battle over the vision that you hold in your heart. Devil will destroy you by putting the, his thoughts and his intentions and his ideas inside of you and causing you to meditate on that more than what God said. Then you're in trouble. We take the word of God out of the schools. We take the word of God out of the culture. We take the word of God out of our lives and we take hope out of our lives. Your life. See God's vision. Get a new vision. Get it from the word of God. The Lord loves you. Immerse yourself in that vision, even if you have to get endless loop cassettes. Do you have some of those? (laughs) You know where they are, Donovan? You can get a hold of those. Donovan will help you. Identify those thought patterns that are causing all the darkness. I'm telling you, you are, you, are, you are created in the very image of God. You have dignity. You have honor. You are made a little bit lower than the angels to rule and reign with Christ. How many know that's true? God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. Secular society doesn't believe this, but we believe it. My life makes sense because I'm connected to him. How about you? I have a vision for my future. I have a vision for your future. God has a vision for your future. It's a glorious future. We can only find that vision when we immerse ourselves in the word of God. Secondly, begin to speak it. You know, with this woman, she says, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. She not only said it once, she said it over and over and over and over and over again. You can, you can speak what God says over your life, even though what it looks like in your life isn't happening. It doesn't look like the circumstances are aligning. It doesn't look like it's going to come to pass. It doesn't look like there's any hope. But that doesn't matter. We speak God's word over the situation anyway. And then things begin to change. Pastor Cho taught... Um, He says, vision is the mother of faith. If you have no faith, see the vision in your godly imagination of what God intends it to be and what God's promised it to be. And when you see that new vision in your godly imagination and begin to speak it out, that's the mother of faith. You will believe it. And that's the third thing she did. She believed it. She not only said it, if I touch his garments, I will be made whole, but she actually believed it. And she believed it enough to act on it. 
How many know when your symptoms are contrary, your circumstances are contrary, if you really don't believe it, it's going to be hard to act on it because it takes all kinds of effort to act against your symptoms and act against what your, what your circumstances are saying and what other opinions are, and you just say, I'm going to do it. Right? Then fifthly, she received it. The Lord looked at her and said, Great is your faith. Your faith has made you whole. How many know your faith can make you whole? Your faith can make you whole. God has good things for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want us to stand, and we're just going to praise God for this scripture right here. Colossians 2.10. What does it say? Everybody read it. In Christ. Look at this. You are complete through your union with Christ. Everybody say, I am complete through my union with Christ. Say that. I am complete through my union with Christ. That word complete in the Greek, it means nothing missing. Everything is set in place for you to live an abundant life. Every need provided, every sickness healed. Every spiritual need met. You say, well, I'm not complete. I got all these holes. I got holes in my life, holes in my marriage, holes in my future. You know what the Lord is saying? The Lord is saying, when you have Jesus, you really have everything because when Jesus lives on the inside of you, healing lives on the inside of you. Grace lives on the inside of you. Peace lives on the inside of you. Power lives on the inside of you. Provision lives on the inside of you. His his mercy and favor lives on the inside of you. Everything you need to live a successful life is in you. You are complete through your union with him. Wow. (laughs) That could get a Presbyterian excited. I don't have to beg and beg and beg. All I have to do is go to God and pray and believe and receive. How many know that's different than begging and begging and begging and begging? What kind of vision does this scripture give you? What does your life look when it's complete? What does it look like? When all the holes are filled and all the empty places are taken care of and all your diseases are healed and all your... Disappointments are restored. What does it look like? That's a brand new vision. That's the vision God has for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want us just to surrender to his vision, God's vision, not the enemy's vision, not the world's vision, not the humanistic vision, not the atheistic vision, but a God vision. The Bible says that through the blood of Jesus, we are redeemed from the curse. We are set free from our past. We give you praise, God.